going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker, Ben Taylor. So Ben Taylor is the chief AI evangelist at Data Robot. He studied chemical engineering. He worked at Intel and Micron, worked at a hedge fund as a quant, was the chief data scientist for HireVue, co-founded and more recently sold a deep learning auto ML company called Zeph to Data Robot. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and bring Ben Taylor up on stage. Hey, Ben. Thanks, Kate. I'll start by sharing my screen. Yep, and go for it. There so, you go. I'm gonna go ahead and present that. So you're talking about producing data diamonds from data swamps. And I'm gonna go ahead and hop off and give you the, the virtual stage here. Okay. Thanks, Kate. So when, when I put this talk together, I didn't make the Rihanna connection, but now it's pretty obvious. So of course you wanted to end it with Sky, but it's data swamps. Start my timer here, so I'm good on time. So I've got an embarrassing story that I haven't shared before, and I love sharing embarrassing stories, especially the ones that make me look quite stupid. So I remember walking to college, um, walking to class, and I was a young college kid, and a van pulled up, and they had some speakers to sell. And I think I ended up I'm really embarrassed to say this. I think I bought some speakers for $300 that I didn't need. And it ended up being a scam where they they weren't worth that. And um, and the funny thing about that is, why the hell would I buy speakers when I'm a poor college kid and I don't have a speaker problem? And along those lines, it reminds me of the big data. It, it, and of obviously, big data offered value for a few companies. But it feels kind of like a scam. So why did you build out that Hadoop cluster? if you didn't have a big data problem. And I remember giving a talk um, right during the big data hype cycle when it was spinning up in Orlando, where I'm speaking to a crowd of HR professionals about big data and Hadoop. And I'm thinking, I don't think there's anyone in this entire industry in HR that needs big data because I can solve a million resume problem on my laptop and most companies don't have a million resumes. So the promise of the data lake became a data swamp for many companies. And the, the funny thing about nerds is data swamps are still pretty cool. And so talking to different companies and different people in the community, do you have five nodes in your Hadoop cluster? Do you have 10, do you have 15? At the hedge fund, I worked on a cluster of 600 uh, GPUs. And is that better? It's kind of like having bigger tires. Doesn't mean you're actually gonna really go anywhere faster necessarily. If anything, it might create problems. But I think it's so funny looking back on the big data hype because the, the pitch was you can answer all the questions. Well, what questions? All of them. All of the questions you didn't know you had, you can answer them all. And it's kind of like a diamond mining because if you ask enough questions, so if there's enough business intelligence hustle, you never know. Maybe eventually you'll ask the right question and it'll be transformational for your company. Um, yeah, it's so funny now looking back on this big data hype, but there, there's a big problem. So why did the data lake become a data swamp for a lot of companies? You have to remember that humans made this. So we underestimated the data quality value. And I've personally seen this. I've seen, I've worked with Salesforce data where time series uh, columns will jump into another column and different labels have inconsistencies, missing data. It's almost like you are dealing with a hoarder house, but with multiple tenants that are changing over time. And that is what we're trying to build value from. And I've also dealt with unstructured data where you have humans that are labeling images for many, many months. And then you find out months later that they were only saving one label or they weren't saving the data at all. So they, they're, not, they're not in a position to get a return on that human investment. And the important thing to remember is humans, we're not, we're not totally terrible. We don't lack attention and we're not always sloppy, but maybe we are sometimes, but we also build tools. We've been building tools for thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years. And so what tools can we use to help us with these data swamps? And so I, I've got I've got three, three key things to share with you. So this is Paul Francis. He is my periodontist. And it's it's essentially a level two miracle, but I found him by having a climbing accident and he was gonna fix my teeth. Turns out that he was also a big mountain climber. And so we started doing these a uh, big wall climbs together. And so before you go off and climb, you have a mission and you need to think about the mission. You don't build up these data lakes for the sake of building them. And you don't use AI for the sake of AI. If you do that, it's destined to, destined to fail. So instead of going from the data to value, you need to go the opposite direction. You need to go Z to A, mission first, data second. What is the mountain you're going to climb? And um, sophisticated data scientists talk about converting statistical metrics into KPIs, but now with COVID and kind of the urgency of the market, KPIs need to come okay. They have to become OKR. So what are the urgent 
business missions that you're trying to satisfy this quarter and how can you use data to do that? So Z to A, storytelling for the win. A lot of us have seen talks about black box models, how can we trust them? And that was totally the case years ago. We lack the storytelling capabilities inside these models, not just in the deep learning models, but also in some of the, the tree-based models. We didn't have the prediction level insights that we have today. And what we're finding with storytelling is you can take a massive data set, and this can be using supervised learning where I'm chasing a label, but it can also be unsupervised learning and using deep learning, reinforced learning, you can actually produce in codings, unstructured data becoming structured. Uh, think of Burton codings for text or Im pre-trained image net encodings for image. And if you cluster these encodings, they can do some unbelievable things. This is an image I've shared many times when I've, when I've given talks, where by building a CNN classifier for faces to predict which country you're from, if you cluster that encoding layer, it'll actually begin to produce the continents. And this is something that um, a subject matter expert, they'll see intuition in this. They'll agree with this. This will make sense to them. And I have found time and time again that this type of clustering with your data, you can find du data duplication issues and you can find issues that you had no, like a, a default image or like a missing image in, if you're scraping data from the web and there are missing image defaults, those would pull, they would show up immediately with this type of clustering. So that's a way for you to kind of get a captain's view of the data that you're dealing with. And the other thing that I have found that's been very, very useful, this is the last point, is this idea of continuous learning acceleration. So if I'm dealing, so, so a few thoughts here. If you tell me that humans have been dealing with this data, I'm, I'm actually going to assume the worst. I'm going to assume that they struggle with label accuracy. There may be bias in the data, maybe even an unconscious bias in the case of hiring or in the case of appraisals that's being applied there. And so I want to inspect the data. I'm not going to take your word for it. I want to go take a look, do random sampling of the labels in, and see if the, it really is that good. If I don't have any labels, I can play. I can pay strangers to label my data. So think of Mechanical Turk or other services online. The issue we find with that, it's not. it still offers value for some companies. They really don't care about your data. And so it's not just one human looking at an image or a video clip and labeling it. A lot of times you have to do voting. It's three humans and you're gonna take the best two out of three votes or we see cases where it's sometimes higher. It's seven humans, you're gonna take the best five out of seven votes. And so my recommendation is sure you can use a human labeling surface like that, but you can also use AI to do labeling yourself. So I've surprised some people because I've been able to label very large data sets from scratch in a day. And the way I do that is I start by building a weak model. So I might manually label a thousand images or a thousand um, clips and then build a very weak model. But a weak model is better than no model. And as soon as I have a weak model, I can begin to sort my data set. And I can begin to look for areas where I suspect to find misclassifications. I can begin to correct those. And I can also put in some thresholding where I'm automatically assigning labels. And what happens is you begin to retrain the model, retrain the model, retrain the model. And then when it comes to the human review, instead of reviewing one observation at a time, which is very time consuming, so to label a thousand images, it might take several hours to do that if you're doing it you know, methodically, you can then kind of graduate to this accelerated review where you're looking at a 10 by 10 mosaic of images or a 10 by 10, um, you're, you're starting to pack animations if you're doing video or you're adding audio files together. That way you're listening to random samples very quickly, not just one at a time. So if you follow these steps, I'm sure you will all shine bright like a diamond when it comes to mining your data swamps. Always assume the data is bad, find a problem worth solving, um, and use AI to accelerate, accelerate yourself and augment yourself as you try to deal with these data labels. So I'll stop there. And oh, here's a QR code to find me on LinkedIn quickly. And I'll go back to, back to video. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Ben. I was also trying to remove your screen. That's why there was a there was a lag. I love your presentation. You you have so many comments, and I agree about your ability to tell stories about all this stuff. And people really really uh, agree with everything that you're saying. There's a comment here from Cindy Hawson. She's saying uh, she agrees mission first, or ideally business outcomes first. Then uh, what data is needed to support that? But if an organization is new to analytics experimentation or bottoms up with data is also okay if you time box it. What, what are your thoughts on that? 
I, I love this question by Cindy. So I think data science has kind of promised we're really good at programming math and we're good at domain expertise. And I've realized through trial and error that we are not that good at domain expertise. And so sometimes the people that need to be in the conversation aren't even invited. It's a technician, it's someone, maybe they're not a VP, maybe they're not a director, maybe they don't have a PhD, but they've worked this process for 10 years or 20 years. And so I love talking to underwriters and insurance or people that are actually working the process every day because they have fantastic insights. And so identify the problem and then find the humans that have been manually working that process the longest and interview them and take mm -hmm. a lot of notes. And I found that's very helpful. Awesome. Thank you. And um, back to your storytelling, you, you told me your teeth story and a lot of um, a lot of others have, I guess, heard your teeth story. Not sure if they've all seen the picture. It's a very graphic picture. We won't pull it up here for fear of scaring people. But yeah, you got hurt pretty bad. And at least you met your uh, what's his name? Paul, Paul Francis. Thanks. thanks yeah. Guys. Yeah. So for people listening, I fell 20 feet with a rope in my mouth and I bit down on it. So I, I lost at least a tooth. You could argue a tooth and a half. And and I, I met one of my best climbing partners afterwards. So awesome. Let me just see what. OK, there is a question here. What is an OCR? You mentioned that our KPIs need to become OCRs. Oh, OKRs. So those are sorry, o OCR, that would stand for optical character recognition. Maybe that was my brain misfiring. So OKRs, that would be quarterly goals. So mm -hmm. KPIs are great for business, but it's really good to align with management and executives, what are they actually being held accountable to this quarter? What What is the quarterly goal that they're trying to hit? And can your data problems and models help with that? And so it, it brings um, kind of the spirit of urgency that I think is lacking from a lot of data science conversations when it comes to deliver, delivering value. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicole's asking if there will be a recording of this. Yes, there will be a recording of the full four hours on YouTube and on LinkedIn, this will stay on LinkedIn. If you register for the conference, you actually receive the recording. If you've not registered, go to storybydata.com slash dedicated conference. I think today is going to be the last day I ever get those words out of my mouth. I said it every day <laughs> for the past two months. And there have been also a lot of questions about where to get this t-shirt. If you guys notice, oh, yeah. all the teachers are wearing a t-shirt. So I could share a link to that. But if you go to Story by Data, there's a, there's a merch shop for, for all this dedicated stuff out there. Um, all right, let's see. Question, uh, comment here from Monica, always assume the data is bad. This is great. Yeah, I love that That love last point. If, if humans have touched it, chances are something's bad. Well, to pull on that, people don't realize that humans have an accuracy. There's always an accuracy assigned to any human process. I mm -hmm. think sometimes we forget, we think it's 100%. But until you audit it, you don't know. And that's a very scary thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, question here from Satish. Could you please suggest uh, tips to become better storyteller from your experience? Uh, practice helps. I just read a book called Stories That Stick that I really liked. Um, I, yeah, th th that would be an entire conversation. I think, Kate, you care a lot about this topic as well. Uh, practice is great. Um, details matter. I, it, it allows you to, uh, to connect with other humans. So it allows the emotions to connect with your audience rather than the rational argument that we typically go with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think storytelling can, uh, you can read books all you want, but I think listening to good stories and then practicing telling stories is probably the best way to, to get better at it. Yeah. Um, all right, Pedro says, there is normally no such thing as bad data. It's bad data parenting. What do you think, Ben? Uh, yeah, I think it's not the data's fault. It's the people that were managing it. Um, but yeah, it's... It's shocking how bad things can get out of control when you look inside a Salesforce database or inside a data lake where people really didn't care. I love the parenting example because it's almost like you have kids running wild in an organization because there was no accountability. And then they, they have dreams and ambitions about using AI. And when the AI consultants come in, they're terrified and horrified of what they're seeing. <laughs> yeah, I can totally picture that. See, it goes back to your great data storytelling. You painted a picture here. Um, LinkedIn user, so somebody private, is asking, what other recommendations do you have to assess the quality of data besides clustering? Oh, I, I forgot to mention, so with deep learning, it'll actually show activations. So if I'm looking inside audio, I can see temporal activations in the spectrogram. If I'm looking at images, it'll actually show me which areas of the image are activating. And mm -hmm. there's very 
Um, there's famous examples of this where you can catch issues like uh, a classic one I just saw is an image was saying that this was a wolf and not a husky dog. Mm -hmm. And when I looked, when you look at the image, you see it's activating on the snow. And that's where a domain expert say, would say, wait a second, why is it activating on the snow and not the dog's face? And that goes back into the training set that, you know, wolves tend to be in snow and the AI was dumb and it <laughs> took advantage of that. So I really like um, spatial activations. Um, okay, yeah. awesome. And we'll take a uh, last question here from Frederick. How much uh, UX research should be applied to data visualizations and data storytelling? Uh, probably a lot. And this is probably more a question for you, Kate, on the visual I'm gonna story. Say as much as possible. Yeah. yeah, as much as possible. And I've, I've learned this the hard way. I've the best thing you can give is a single number with a dollar sign. If you can't give that, give one number that they understand. If you can't give that, give a three bar chart or something that's very simple. And I've made mistakes of building custom plots where you're so proud of yourself for look at this amazing visualization I built and it just confuses your audience. They have no idea what they're looking at and they feel dumb and it doesn't help the conversation at all. Yeah, I, I, I get that. They're just, um, people are just saying thank you and uh, they're loving your session. The comments are going so fast. It's literally hard to like, I'll, I'll read a really good one and then like 10 more come in. I'm like, okay, well that question's gone now. Um, but then I want to thank you so much for, for being here today. At this point, we're going to close out the first session, which is data governance and wrangling. We're going to move over to data literacy and data visualization. So thank you again for, for being here. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of great comments coming in. So go on LinkedIn and check those out. We couldn't get to most of the questions, unfortunately, due to our very, very limited time here. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Great conference. I've loved the other speakers so far. Awesome. Thank you so much.